Jennifer Pan had her every move controlled by her parents. She began lying about her activities in order to keep up with her parents' expectations. But when the lies began unraveling, she had to take drastic action to free herself from their grasp. This is Monsters. Han Pan was born in Vietnam, and after school, his family immigrated to Canada in 1979. Bick also immigrated to Canada around the same time, and the two eventually met and married. They both began working for a local manufacturing company, Magna International. Han was a tool and die maker, and Bick made auto parts. They settled down in the Scarborough area of Toronto. They had two children, Jennifer in 1986 and Felix in 1989. Their family placed a lot of importance on success and image, wanting both of their children to be the best they could be. Unfortunately, sometimes that family dynamic can become more of a burden for the child than a benefit. Jennifer started piano lessons at age four and began figure skating at age eight. She began competing in figure skating competitions and was hoping to make it to the 2010 Olympics. That dream was ripped away when she tore her ACL and had to stop skating. She took martial arts classes for a while, and after she gave up figure skating, she began playing the flute. People refer to Han and Bick as tiger parents. Wikipedia says tiger parenting is a form of strict or demanding parenting. Tiger parents push and pressure their children to attain high levels of academic achievement or success in high-status extracurricular activities such as music using authoritarian parenting methods. Jennifer was not allowed to go to dances, parties, or have a boyfriend, claiming that she should refrain from dating until after graduating from college. Jennifer attended Mary Ward Catholic School, and she stayed up late into the night studying in order to keep up with her parents' expectations. Her father, Han, was baptized at birth as Catholic, and her mother, Bick, was a Buddhist. Jennifer said she practiced a combination of both religions. She was an excellent student until the ninth grade when her grades started falling. She always got top marks in music, but the rest of her grades were in the 70% range. She would use old report cards and a photocopier to forge report cards with straight A's to give to her parents. This is where the lying to keep her parents happy started. In 11th grade, Jennifer met Daniel Wong, who played trumpet in the school band where she played flute. These first clips are from her second interview, where she goes into more detail about the incident and her life. We went to high school together. He helped me through a really difficult time in high school. Um, when I have asthma, but it, it wasn't a concern. Uh, it was only a concern when I was younger. Um, but when I went over to Europe, um, a lot of sick people were smoking cigarettes and it acted up over there and he took care of me over there. When did you go to Europe? 2003. Okay, and how long were you there for? Under two weeks, I think. Okay. So this is 2003 when you and Danny were started dating? No, uh, later on in 2003, we were just friends at that point. Okay. During a school band trip to Europe, after performing in an auditorium full of smokers, Jennifer had a bad asthma attack and Daniel calmed her down and coached her through her breathing. After that, the two became good friends and eventually started dating. So how does your relationship with Danny develop? Where, where does it go and how long does it last? It lasted about six years. Um, it began in the summer of 2003, before my grade 12 year. Uh, we were just really good friends and I guess it just happened. Like we just started going out. Well, saying that we were going out, but... Um, I didn't really get to see him much. Let's talk about that. Why didn't you get the chance to see him much? I wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend. And that was when you were 18? I was 17. 17, turning in your 18th year? Mm, in grade I 11 just, or going to grade, grade, no, going grade. grade 12? Okay. And uh, so who was against you having a boyfriend? 
My father. Your father? How is your mother in this? She took a back seat to his opinion. Um, she would tell me that I gotta find someone who was devoted to me. But at that time, she just, my father was the one that enforced the rules. And what were the issues your father had with a boyfriend? Was it Danny in particular, or, Dan- or was it just no, a boy? Just any boy. Daniel and Jennifer started dating in secret due to her father's prohibition of boyfriends. They started the 12th grade attending the same school, but Daniel started falling behind at Mary Ward and was transferred to Cardinal Carter Academy. He would still come to Jennifer's school and visit her, and she would skip school to go visit him. This didn't help her grades, but even though she wasn't getting straight A's, she was still accepted to Ryerson University, but then she failed her calculus course and didn't graduate from high school. Due to her failing grade, Ryerson withdrew their offer. In an effort to not have her parents find out about her real high school grades, she dug her lie a little deeper and told them she would be starting Ryerson in the fall. I wanted to do kinesiology, but my my father was very adamant on doing something in the medical field that was a little bit more, um, in his opinion, more like a more successful. I guess you can say, um, he knew I didn't have the stomach for being a doctor. Um, so he wanted me to become a pharmacist. Okay. Did you go to school for pharmacy? Did you get any university for pharmacy? So if you are you finish your grade 12, you go to OI, your OIC year? Like grade 12 is you finish your OIC year. I don't have OIC. I didn't have OIC. I finished my grade 12. And then where... where do you... what do you do for the next few years? While your dad's wanting you to get into the medical field, what do you do? I was trying to get into piano. What school? I I was still taking classes at a conservat like a a school, but it's still recognized in the community as a teacher's license through the Royal Conservatory. Yes. You can correct me if you're Canadian, but from what I can find, an OAC year is an additional year of secondary school for students who plan to go to college. It looks like they have eliminated it from being mandatory, though. She wanted to study kinesiology, which is the study of the mechanics of body movement, which sounds interesting. She says her father wanted her to do something more successful, but what I think she meant is that her father thought that becoming a kinesiologist wasn't good enough, and that she needed to get a career that held a more respectable view. She says at one point in her police interview that her parents weren't rich, but her mom drove a Lexus, her dad drove a Mercedes, and they had a nice big house. Her parents wanted to maintain that type of image. What did you lie to him? What did you tell him? That I was going to school. For? Uh, For just pre-med, not pre-med, sorry, science. For science. Bachelor of Science. You would have had bills for school. How how was that coming up? How are these bills being paid for for university that you weren't going to? I was working at Eastside Mario's and I took care of myself. So like he, financially, my father was never, he never took hand in bills. So he didn't know anything about bills. Did your mom know that you weren't going to university? No. So both your parents thought you had gone to university? Yes. Okay. And um, how long did that, how long, did they still to this point in time think that you had gone to university for, for, pharma- for sciences? Yes. Jennifer told her parents that she was going to do two years of science and then transfer to the University of Toronto's pharmacology program. She told her parents that she had gotten a loan and that she had won a $3,000 scholarship to cover the cost of schooling. She even went as far as to buy used textbooks and other supplies to keep up her charade. Each morning, while her parents thought Jennifer was going to school, she would really take a bus downtown and use the internet at the public library to look up science topics and make notes about the subject to show her parents back at home. She, of course, would spend any time she could with Daniel and also got a job where he worked. Jennifer first started working as a server at Eastside Mario's, but eventually started working as a bartender at Boston Pizza, where Daniel was the kitchen manager. She also taught piano lessons and took some classes at the Royal Conservatory to become a piano teacher. After two years of lying about going to college, Han was expecting Jennifer to transfer to the University of Toronto. 
Instead of fessing up to her deception and getting her life back on track, she told her father that she was accepted into the school's pharmacology program and would be attending U of T that fall. Not only that, but she doubled down on her lie and suggested that she stay with her friend, Topaz, three days a week in order to make her commute better. Her parents believed that would be a good idea. Less commute meant more time for studying. The reality was that Jennifer actually went and stayed at Daniel's house during those days. Daniel still lived with his parents, and Jennifer told them that her parents agreed to let her stay there. Daniel's parents constantly suggested meeting Han and Bick, but Jennifer kept blowing them off. As if her current lies weren't enough, she eventually told her parents that she started volunteering at a blood testing lab at the hospital Sick Kids. She told him that she would be working late night shifts and suggested that she stay over at Topaz's house more often. This eventually aroused Han's suspicion and he insisted that they drop her off at her shift the next day. When Jennifer went into the hospital, she noticed that her mom was following her, so she hid in the hospital until her parents left. The next morning, her parents called Topaz and asked to speak to Jennifer. Topaz forgot which day it was and told the Pans that her daughter wasn't there. When Jennifer arrived home, her lies finally came crashing down around her. She confessed that she didn't volunteer at Sick Kids. She wasn't attending the pharmacology program at the University of Toronto and that she had really been staying with Daniel. Her parents didn't take it well. My mother, she said at first she was like not supportive, but she said, you need to tell me. And she basically gave me the, um, the sex talk, which basically was one moment could ruin your entire life. Um, but once my father found out, without even knowing him, he automatically put judgment. What kind of judgment did your father pass on him? He blamed my lying and even racial um, profiling on him. And what does that mean? I don't know about the racial profile. Um, he is half Filipino, half Chinese. Yes. And my father associated him with Filipino and said that, you know, he wasn't a good match for me. He wasn't going anywhere in life and um, that he wouldn't be able to support a family. Because he was Filipino, he wasn't a good match for her. So they took away her phone and restricted her to a curfew. They pretty much uh, make sure that I wouldn't contact him again. And how do they do that? They take away my cell phone and restrict internet access. Like, they have to be in the room or not at all. Do you have a curfew? If I go out with a friend that they know, I have to be home before 9. Before 9 o'clock? Yes. And is that even up until... Monday? Did you have a curfew up until Monday? Uh, technically, but I don't. I haven't gone out for a while. And why is it that you haven't gone out for a while? Because they gave me an ultimatum to either choose Daniel or to choose them about a year and a half ago, or two about a year and a half ago, and I chose to stay home with my family. But even though he had moved on. I, uh, we still wanted to be friends. Um, we went through a lot. I was there for him and he was there for me when we needed each other. So I, whenever I could, I would sneak a phone call here, a sneak a phone call there. Um, I'd ask a friend of mine to pick me up and to take me to see him and then take me back. She's 22 years old at this point. Her parents have taken away her phone and given her a curfew like she's a teenager. They basically told a grown adult that she's grounded. Jennifer's parents made her quit her jobs other than teaching piano, which was the one thing that Jennifer still loved doing. After a couple of weeks, she was able to go out and give piano lessons, but her parents kept a close eye on her. Even then, she still visited Daniel when she could and talked to him on the phone in secret. She also enrolled in a calculus course so that she could graduate from high school. 
She must have had to do that in secret, because she had admitted that she hadn't been attending U of T, but as far as her parents knew, she had graduated high school and attended Ryerson for two years. Jennifer got caught another time after sneaking out of her house at night and going to see Daniel. She had forgotten that she had Bick's wallet, and when her mother went into her room in the morning to get it, she noticed that Jennifer was gone. She was ordered to come home immediately. They gave her an ultimatum that she could either go be with Daniel or stay there with them. In police interviews, she tells the detectives multiple times that she chose them because family was always more important. She told a detective that her father told her that if she chose Daniel, he would hire a private investigator to follow her around, so I'm not sure how much of a choice it was. She was still willing to sneak phone calls with Daniel, but she was too afraid to leave the house. Daniel had grown frustrated with the situation and broke up with Jennifer. Obviously, Jennifer was upset about the breakup, but when she found out that he had started dating another girl, Christine, she really fell into a depression. She was hoping to ride out her parents' control until they could finally be together for good, and she felt like she wasn't good enough because he wasn't willing to wait. Jennifer turned to the only coping mechanism she knew, lying. She told Daniel that she was home alone one day, and she was attacked. That is something I lied to him about. Okay, tell me about that. Um, I told him I was raped, but I was just very depressed and... Sorry, this is very embarrassing. Um, don't, don't, you haven't reported it to the police, right? This is a, this is an interaction between you and an ex-boyfriend, okay? So you're, you're not in any trouble for this. And it's mm-hmm. important that we clear it up because he's telling us stuff. Yeah. And then we're, we're coming back to you. So. Yes, but this is something I lied to him about. Okay. Um, and why did, and you say you were depressed. And, and when did this happen? When did this, when did you tell him about this? Maybe a year ago. A year ago. And what was it that you told him? That um, someone came to the door, and when I went to open the door, uh, they pushed me down and raped me. Did they? Did you give descriptions? Did you provide descriptions to them about it? To him about it? I might have. I I don't remember exactly what I said. Okay. Um, But you're telling me to my face that this never happened. This never happened. Okay, so it's not, this isn't something that we need to be looking at as something that's tied to this. No, this is, that was my lie to him. Okay. She lied to him to get attention and also to make Christine look bad. She claimed that Christine had orchestrated the attack and then said that she had sent her a bullet in the mail. Daniel told her to report it, but she couldn't because, well, it never happened. She also told the detective that she had been receiving threats. Have you... Have you been experiencing anything, what you would call in the last little while, of any type of threats or threatening behavior? Yes. Tell me about that. Um, his, I don't, well, he says it's just a friend, but everyone says it's his girlfriend. Um, she has messaged me telling me to back off, to leave Daniel alone, and... He's messaged me and he's like, is that you calling? But I wasn't calling. Or I'd be on the phone with him and he's like, your other, uh, my Rogers line? Because I called him on the the phone that he gave me. Yes. And he'd say that my Rogers line was calling him. And when I looked into it, it was like on the on my bills. Those phone calls were made, but I know I didn't make them. So I, w- I couldn't explain it. And I did get uh, a letter in the mail saying that uh, you're a dead person walking. Now, why didn't you tell me about that last when I spoke to you the other day? I Everything had just happened. I wasn't... It, was it just simply a letter? Yes. It was uh, cut out. Where is that letter? It's garbage. In the garbage? Yes. I didn't think too much of it at that time. And what did you equate it to? Just jealousy. You still are equating it to the, the friend or the girlfriend? Well, I don't want to... Like, I don't know 100%, so I don't want to point fingers. Why? So if you're not 100% and 
and you don't want to point fingers, why do you believe it's her? Because she has personally messaged me on Facebook telling me that I'm stupid and to back off and to leave Daniel alone. Eh, just another death threat. No big deal. She claimed that Daniel said Christine was only a friend, but when he was interviewed by police, he had no hesitation calling her his girlfriend. In early 2010, Jennifer contacted a former classmate from elementary school named Andrew Montemayor. Jennifer claimed that Andrew used to brag about robbing people at knife point, and after hearing about Jennifer's problems with her dad, he claimed that he had once considered killing his own father. After expressing her own interest in a similar solution, Andrew introduced Jennifer to his roommate, Ricardo Rick Duncan. Jennifer claims that she gave Rick $1,500 to murder her father in the parking lot of his employer. They were supposed to meet again to pick a specific date, but he stopped taking her calls and she realized that he had ripped her off. According to Rick, Jennifer called him in early July and asked him to kill her parents. He was offended and said no. He said that the only money he had ever taken from her was $200, which he borrowed and then paid her back. By the end of summer of 2010, Daniel and Jennifer were back in regular communication. The two devised a plan to hire a hitman to kill Han and Bick. Jennifer would be looking at a $500,000 payout if her parents died. Then the couple could finally be together. Daniel gave Jennifer an iPhone with a new SIM card for her to use only for the planning of the killing. He put her in touch with a man named Lenford Crawford, who told her that it would normally be $20,000 for a hit, but for a friend of Daniel's, he'd do it for $10,000. 50% off. What a deal. Just before 10 p.m. on the night of November 8, 2010, three armed men entered the Pan residence and demanded money. They took money that Jennifer had saved before tying her hands behind her back. They demanded money from Han and Bick, who only had the cash in their wallets. And they found over $1,000 in U.S. currency in the bedside table in the master bedroom. They tied Jennifer to a stair banister on the top floor before taking Han and Bick downstairs to the basement where the assailants shot them both. The three men ran out the front door and shortly after, Han climbed up the stairs and stumbled out the front door. He ran into a neighbor who was about to leave to go to work. Jennifer had stuck her phone in the back of her pants before being tied up and claimed that she had been able to get her phone out and call 911. The neighbor had also called 911. Police and paramedics were quickly on the scene. Bick was pronounced dead at the scene, and Han and Jennifer were transported to the hospital. After a short visit at the hospital and some anxiety medication to calm her nerves, Jennifer was taken to Markham Police Station, where she was interviewed by Detective Randy Slade at about 2.45 a.m. Detective Slade is very nice to Jennifer, which is understandable because she's not being interrogated. She's making a statement as a witness to a crime. I don't believe she's being considered as a suspect at all. At the time of the incident, Jennifer's brother, Felix, wasn't living at home. He was getting a degree in engineering and only stayed at his parents' house periodically. At the time, it was only Han, Bick, and Jennifer who were in the home. Detective Slade asks her to start at the beginning of the day and tell him what happened. She explained that her mother had awakened her at about 9.30 in the morning so they could go visit her grandfather. He was in a nursing home and wasn't doing well, so Bick and another relative were going to visit him. When they left the house, she said there were police officers all around and they told them that there was a gas leak and they wouldn't be able to use that part of the street. Bick was going to go down the street and use a friend's car, but the officer told her that he had just received word that the street was cleared and they could use the road. At this point, Jennifer decided to stay home and practice her piano. Bick returned home at about 3 p.m. and began making dinner shortly after. Han would normally arrive home around 4 p.m., but that day he was late because he forgot to lock something at work and had to turn around and go back. The fact that he didn't call to let her know that he was going to be late was something that Bick argued with him about. Jennifer said that she and her mother ate dinner together, and her father ate alone after he got home. After dinner, she called a friend, Adrian, and had him come over to watch television, something they did on a regular basis. Han had gone out with her uncle after dinner to go shopping, and he returned home about 6.30 p.m. 
Then, Bic changed and left to go dancing at 7 p.m., something she did every Monday with other family members. By then, Han had gone upstairs to the office to read the Vietnamese news and watch Vietnamese soaps. Adrian left the house at 9 p.m. and Jennifer went upstairs to get ready for bed. Han was still in the office, on the computer. Bick came home at about 9.15 while Jennifer was in her room talking on the phone to a past co-worker named Ed. She asked Ed to hold on and went downstairs to say hello to her mom before going back up to her room. By now, Han had gone into the master bedroom to go to sleep. Ed had hung up the phone, so Jennifer called him back and they continued talking. Sometime between 9.30 and 10 p.m., Jennifer heard her mother calling for her father. She said that her mother's tone indicated that something was wrong, and she also heard unfamiliar voices. She told Ed that she had to go and went to investigate. Suddenly, I just heard my mom calling for my dad to come down. And that's when I lowered the volume on my TV, and I could hear the voices weren't any voices I was very familiar with. And so I was scared, and I couldn't move. I just sat in my room for a while. And then I thought I heard them all let, like leave the top floor, and I peered out of my bedroom door. And a guy was there, and he came at me, and had string in his hands and tied my arms back and said, I have a gun behind your back. Do what I say. If you do what I say, then no one will get hurt. Where is the money? Show me where your money is. I, um, I have still a few, a bit of money put aside from when I was waitressing cash. So I showed him where it was, and he took it and put it in his pocket, I think. And then that's where they, they pushed me to my parents' room and asked me where the money was there, and I didn't really know. So they kind of like, one was right beside me, blocking my way to the door, while the other ones turned over the bed to find some more cash in my mom's bedside table. The intruders were looking for money. This is her initial story, which is quick and not extremely detailed. She says that she doesn't know how they got into the home. Normally, the last person to go to bed checks to make sure the doors are locked, and she wasn't sure if anyone had done that yet, as her mother was still awake. The sliding glass door, is it locked all the time? Occasionally, it's forgotten to be locked. But... For the most part, we do check it before we go to bed, before everybody. The last person is supposed to check everything before turning in. But on some occasions, it's how do you know that it's been unlocked? When my mother goes out to water the plants the next morning, it's open. And she makes a comment about that? She comments to my father that he had forgotten when he went out to water his grass and the night before. What about your front door? How do you, what is that when you guys are home or when you guys are home in the house, do you lock your front door or do you keep it, or do you keep it all unlocked? Occasionally it's left unlocked because the way our family is, we have family that come over after dinner. So sometimes we leave the door unlocked, but it will always be locked before bed. The last person going into bed. The last person always locks it. Yes. And you said something about Sorry. activates the alarm as well? Um, we activate the alarm before we go. Well, we leave the house. So there's, it's not activated when you're in the house and you're going to bed. It's only when there's no one in the house. Yes. She explained that there were three doors into the house. The front door, the back sliding door, and a door that goes into the house from the garage. He told, he grabbed my arm. And he pulled it to the back and said, give me your other arm as well. Okay. And then I was trying to make a wide X so that I could later loosen if I needed it to. But he had pulled really, really tight. And okay. I guess he felt my flinch. And that's when he quickly tied the second knot. I think. I don't exactly know. All I know is like I flinched and then it got tighter. So you were, you were bound behind you? Behind me, yes. Okay. She said that she was tied up in her room and then taken into her parents' room next. In which then they dragged me down the stairs. 
and made me kneel at the bottom, telling me to face down on the floor while the other guy had a gun behind my head, and asked my mom where her purse was. My mom kept trying to get up, and they kept telling her to sit down, and so I didn't want her to get hurt, so I told her mom to sit down. They were trying to find her wallet, but she, her English thing so she kept saying purse. They kept pushing her down onto the chair. Okay. Take your time. Take your time. All this is very important, so take your time. They kept all the lights off on the main floor. The only time there was light was when they opened the fridge door to see if they could find where my mom's purse was. I didn't... At that point, I saw three figures of men. One with a hoodie. Like, the one I could see the most clearly, he had a hoodie on. And I believe he had a bandana of some sort covering from, like, his lower, uh, under his eyes, down. It's important to note that she said that they took her downstairs and had her kneel at the bottom of the stairs and to face down on the floor. She can see one of the men has a hoodie and a black bandana. She eventually explains that there are three men, all black, and her and the detective start referring to them as number one, number two, and number three. Number one is the one that does almost all the talking. He seems to be in charge, and he has a pistol. Uh, he was... Medium build. Okay. I didn't. I don't remember any of his clothing, unfortunately. The only thing I can remember was him was he had dreadlocks. He had dreadlocks. So, are you, uh, it, can you describe his race to me? He was black. Did it was his head covered? Was his face covered? Do you remember anything about that? Just that his dreadlocks were like kind of like flopping all over the place. I couldn't really see his face, and they kept the lights dark as much as as much as possible. How long how long were the dreadlocks? Was it were they, you know, like when you say they're dreadlocks and they were flopping all over his face? It's hard I I don't want to remember a hundred percent. I think some of them were like around his face were a little shorter. Mm -hmm. And then in the back there were there were longer ones. Okay. Now his complexion, um there's various degrees of, of, of of dark. dark to medium dark to to actually light. Uh, I'd say he was. He I wouldn't say he was the darkest person I've seen, but he was on the darker side. Any facial hair? I'd like to say maybe. Say not only what you can think. Sure. Just just say what you what you think. I don't want you to say what you're. But you I don't know. want to say something wrong. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you, if you don't know, then I it's don't. okay to say. It's okay I'm to not say. Sure. Okay. So, can you give an age approximation for this guy? Well, when the other officer asked me, I was leaning along the ages of twenty-eight to thirty-three. So, an, 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 someone who's established in life. I would assume so. Like not established meaning guess. world, meaning that he's been around, been around. So, uh, a twenty-year-old talks completely different than a thirty-year-old, as you know. He seemed to be the one in charge. He seemed to be running the show. He's the one that had me. Like he pretty much did not let me go. He was in charge of me, and all the money I showed him, he pocketed. Okay. Did he have a gun? Did you see the gun? I only saw the top part of the gun. What did it look like? Um, kind of, it was black. Yeah. And it kind of, not triangular, but it was slightly wider at the end than it was closer. Do you know the difference between what a pistol and a revolver is? Yes. Okay. Do you know if it was a pistol or a revol revolver? That particular one that he was holding, I believe, should have been a pistol. A pistol. Okay. Because the difference is the, the round part, right? So you tell me what's a pistol and what's a revolver. Which one has okay. the round part? I would think that the revolver has the, the ones that the bullets go around. Okay. And it didn't look like that. It looked like more like a handgun. So it looked more like a pistol? Yes. What you're saying, not a revolver? No. 
She describes him as being just a little shorter than her, she's 5'7", with shoulder-length dreadlocks. She estimates his age to be between 28 and 33, which seems like an oddly specific age range. Number two never talks and only looks around for money, and number three talks sometimes and has a revolver. And then, for some reason, I think one of the, the gentlemen asked my father if he had money in his wallet and where his wallet was. So they took me, because I was next to the stairwell, they took me up the stairs to sh show them where my father's wallet was, but I'm, I didn't know. They had turned the room upside down. I didn't know where his pants were at that time. And then, after they had gotten that, they had taken me and they tied me to the top of the banister. Just with one string, I could still move, but I was afraid to because the one guy just had that gun. Just Another important detail is that they took her back upstairs and took her into her parents' bedroom a second time. Detective Slade asked her if she was able to see any details of their clothing while they were in her parents' bedroom. Now they, they had, like, something blind me. Like, they, number one, once, when we first got in the room, the light was on. And he's like, hold on. And he grabbed, I don't remember what he grabbed, jacket or sleeve or something, and he kind of, like, shell, shielded me with it. And that's when he took my glasses and he, like, tossed them. So he took your glasses off? Okay. How did you get your glasses back? I asked the officer. Okay. They didn't find Han's wallet, and they took Jennifer to the top of the stairs where they tied her to the banister. She said they didn't tie her to the banister with the same string they used to tie her hands. Number one told number two to, quote, tell Cuzzy to get the string, end quote. Number two comes back with the string, and they tie her upper arm to the banister. So you're now tied to the banister? Yep, he calls for Cuzzy. So he's like, get Cuzzy to give me that string I just gave him. And who is he talking to? Number two. So he says to number two, tell Cuzzy to get me that string. Do you hear any other names during this whole time? Cuzzy. Just Cuzzy. Jennifer also remembers that her mother had $1,100 in U.S. currency in her bedside table. They had recently gone on a trip to Buffalo, New York, and the United States, and when they came back, Bick still had $1,100 in cash. So that $1,100, did it get taken tonight? I believe so. And where would, that, where would that have been? In my mom's bedside table. And you said you saw them. Did they go into that bedside table? Um, and was that the second time that you, when they were upstairs and they were looking for your father's wallet? While they are looking for my father's wallet, they flipped me put the bed off, and they're like, oh, you didn't, you missed that drawer. Like, number one told number two, you missed the drawer. So he, number one, was the one that leaned over and pulled it open. Okay, you guys are inside the bedroom? I was just at the doorway of the bedroom. Okay, so in, where, in relation to this bedroom, and where is this? this? Very tight, very tight space. Okay, so he, he could stay with you and still reach around and grab this and open this drawer, and that's where they well, found Well, he kind of pulled me with one hand closer yeah. as he leaned over, but it was close enough that you could maneuver. Okay, and um, so they grabbed that, that American money. You see it go? I saw him fold it and put it in his pocket. Okay, and did that seem to agitate them? Did you see any change in behavior after, after that? They're like, there has to be more. Details about her being tied up to the banister come up again, and now she says that number one asked for cuz. Okay, and who ties you to the banister? Uh, I'm not sure if number two helped number one, but it was behind me. I'm not sure who did the tying. But number two goes downstairs to get the string yes. to tie, tie you up. And brings it up. And brings it up. From this cuz. Cuz. And you're sure it's cuz, like cuz and cuz. I'm it, assuming. So, no, I'm not saying that that's what it is, but it's on that line of cuz. Yes, go tell cuz. Eventually, Jennifer is left at the top of the stairs, tied to the banister, and she can hear her parents being taken down to the basement. Next thing I know, oh, I think I hear my parents going down the stairs, and my mom was asking them for me to come with them. They wouldn't let me come with them. After they said, don't 
last thing I heard them say was, you lied, you lied to us, you lied to us. And then I heard two pops. My mom screamed. I yelled out for her. Then a couple more pops. Take your time. Take your time. And I think I heard my mom say or moan or something, and then they did one more before they left, and then one of the guys said, we have to go now, it's been too long. And then they ran out the door, and I think when they were out the door, I heard my dad go up the stairs, and at that point, I had my phone in my, po in my, on me, behind me, that I had hidden there that they didn't know about. So, when I, when I, when they, when I thought that they had heard them all leave, and my dad ran up the stairs, I whipped up the phone, and I called 911. But I, I still hadn't heard anything from my mom, and all I could hear was my dad running on the street, just moaning and making sounds. She explained that she had stuck her phone in the back of her pants after number one had come into her room, but before he tied her hands behind her back. She was able to pull her phone out of her pants, twist herself around, and dial 911. She told the detectives that she didn't hear the door open or close when the men went out because there was too much thudding from the footsteps. They had an alarm in their house, but they only set it when they were gone, not at night when they went to sleep. She did hear her father open the door and go outside, and that he was also moaning. She believed that he must have been injured in a way that affected his speech. The way she was tied made it so she couldn't see the front door. When police arrived, she was begging them to free her, but they had to clear the house first. Eventually, one of the officers got a pair of scissors out of her bedroom and cut her free. Apparently, she also asked the officer to get her glasses. Detective Slade asks her why anyone would think that they had cash in their home, and she can't explain. She brings up the fact that her parents both drive nice cars and keep up a good appearance, and maybe that gave someone the wrong idea. At the end of her interview, Detective Slade asks if he can have permission to pull her phone records. Maybe it's hindsight, but she seems very uncomfortable that they want to look at her phone records. She agrees because I think she doesn't want to raise any questions by saying no, but she's visibly rattled by the idea. When the detective steps out of the room for a minute to get the consent form, she gets up and paces around the room. She doesn't do any handstands and she doesn't sing Amazing Grace. She just stretches her legs. She actually seems to be limping as she paces around, and I'm not sure why, maybe from the torn ACL. When Detective Slade comes back, she asks him about the phone records. My question is, how far deep into this will I look for my phone? Just like comment, like regular phone calls to people, just stuff like that? Really, it's just the time stamping of, of the, you know, we, we're putting nine days down. Because it may come back to you that, um, oh, I spoke to him. And it may be able for us to be able to identify people that we may need to go back and interview. The, the interest of us is obviously tonight between 9 and 10, right? After about two hours, the interview is over and she's free to go. During the interview, she left out many important details. She told him that she lived at home because, quote, my parents needed me there, end quote. Not that she was in trouble for her relationship with Daniel. When he asks about her schooling, she tells him she planned to go back to school in January, but she doesn't tell him anything about lying about going to college in the past. When she finds out that her younger brother, Felix, is also being interviewed in a different room, she doesn't ask how he's doing. She says, quote, Oh, he has to be interviewed too? End quote. Yeah, his mother was just murdered, and his father is fighting for his life in the ER. We're going to have a few questions. She's another one of those people who are surprised that, after a major crime is committed, police want to question everyone and investigate every lead. She thought they would just listen to her story and then, case closed. There were other investigators who were watching the interview while it was happening, and they noted that the tissues she used while crying all appeared to be dry. 
They questioned why three men would go into the Pan home, shoot two people, and leave one witness. They also questioned why they would demand more money, but not ask about the safe that was clearly visible in the parents' room. Why didn't they steal either high-end car, even though the keys to the Mercedes were clearly visible on the table? At about the same time Jennifer is leaving the police station, Han was being airlifted to a trauma center in central Toronto, where he's placed in an induced coma. Three days later, Han would wake up from his coma and tell police what happened at his home on the evening of November 8th. He had retained his full memory of the events leading up to being shot in the basement of his own home. As soon as police hear his version of events, they know that they need to talk to Jennifer again. The second part of this story will be available on Wednesday the 19th. Make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications to ensure you don't miss it. You can also go to our subreddit, r forward slash thisismonsters, to discuss these cases. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233, or go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will instantly take your browser to a Google search page. In the event the abuser is nearby, you can assure that you don't get caught trying to get help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Be safe. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at Buy Me A Coffee or check out some of our merchandise at Teespring. You can find information on how to do that along with links to our social media at thisismonsters.com. Thanks again.